Uh, good morning. Uh, my name's Peter Hughes, or as I'm known in this church, the other Peter Hughes. Uh, if you were expecting the other one, I'm sorry to disappoint you today, it's just me. So, um, uh, if you're new or visiting, and I'm, I hope that there are people here who are new or visiting, I, I, I'm kind of new too, so I don't know who you are, so please come and say hello to me at morning tea. Uh, just to explain what we're going to do today, I'm going to explain what it means to be a Christian, I'm going to explain why people want you to become a Christian, uh, I'm going to explain what it means to grow as a Christian, I'm going to explain an entire book of the Bible, and I, how long have I got? I'm going to do that in 30 minutes. So, I am, uh, I'm going to pray. <laughs> Let me pray. Uh, Father, thank You for the, um, the joy it is to hear You speak. Pray now that you'll help me to speak your words faithfully and truthfully. Uh, we pray that as we hear you speak, that your spirit will be at work in us, transforming us and changing us to the people that you have made us to be. And we pray this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Um, what I've been asked to speak on is mission and maturity and I don't know whether the intention was that I was supposed to do this in two sort of small talks but I'm actually going to show how those two things fit together. I'm going to be working through the whole book of Colossians so if you've got that open you'll find that helpful uh, either on your, uh, if you've got a Bible there that would be great or if you've got a, um, a phone or an iPad or an Xbox or something, if you can see that that would be really helpful. Um, if you can't see one, share with the person next to you because we are going to be moving around a little bit. But I want to start by asking, the question, what does the Christian life look like? And because it's early on a Sunday morning, well, early-ish on a Sunday morning, it's early for my teenage kids on a Sunday morning, let me give you, make this a multiple choice thing for you. I think some people think of, uh, let me see, I've got this working. Okay, we'll see how we go. There we are. Uh, some people think of it, th this, this is my attempt at putting it in terms of graphs, I'm, I'm not Terence, I can't do the whole uh, graphic design thing particularly well, but for some people, the Christian life is like this, you know, we become a Christian, you know, at the black dot, that is, Jesus dies for our sin and we go, that's awesome, I'm really glad that Jesus has forgiven me and then I wait until the red dot and that is where I meet Jesus, either through my death or His return, but in the meantime, I don't really need to do much. I mean, Jesus died for my sin, I'm just waiting for that moment when He comes back and I get to enjoy the benefits of it. And so, <coughs> church becomes, uh, well, my Christian life becomes very compartmentalised. I come on Sunday, I get reminded, Jesus died for my sin, go, fantastic, and then the rest of the week, it doesn't really matter. Now, I want to call that cheap grace. Uh, that, that is actually not, as we will see as we work our way through Colossians, that is, I, I'm going to give you the answers as we go along to make it easier for you, uh, that is not actually the way things work. Another way of looking at it is uh, this one, where um, the green kind of graph is my growth in becoming more and more like Jesus and what happens is that I, I meet Jesus, that's the black dot, and then He is a great example for me to follow. And so, I try and live like He does uh, and this is essentially religion, this is what religion looks like but some people think that's what Christianity is, that I keep living like Jesus. Now, often what happens is that people, some people will say, it comes into a fear, the fear is that, am I good enough? Do I get to the top of the line in a, in enough time before Jesus comes back? But actually, the way I think this works out in our lives is that we, as long as we think we're doing a little bit better than everybody else, we're okay, right? So, as long as I'm sort of above average, I'm all right. And so, it's not worrying about how well I'm doing, it's actually looking around going, as long as I'm doing better than everybody else and so I'm watching everybody else, I'm going, are they, are they up to, no, they're not up to my scratch, so I can look down on them, that's essentially the way it works. But the problem with it is, of course, we think that if I'm above, there's an average, the cutoff is the average line, uh, but it's not. Let me give you another option. Uh, this is very similar, if I can get this, uh, there we are, whoops, let me go back. That is, Jesus dies for my sin, He forgives me, which is good, and then, 
well, actually what He does is He forgives all my sins up to the point that I've received Him as my Saviour. And then it's like He goes, well, that's it. I've died for your sin, I've got you on the way, the rest is now up to you. And I have to confess, that's the way I have lived, I, I, I fall into this from time to time in my Christian life. If you're not sure, this is, the, the technical term for this is semi-Pelagianism, and if you're writing notes, good luck with trying to spell that, but it's, uh, it's the idea that on one hand, Jesus gets us going, but the rest of it is up to us. It's like the Spirit of God is not even at work in us, but it is all dependent upon us, and so again, our lives look like, as long as I'm doing better than everybody else, or most people, I'm okay. As long as I'm doing more ministry than other people, as long as I'm turning up to church more than other people, as long as I've got an average that's better than other people. That's uh, a semi-Pelagianism. Now, I want to say, actually, all three of those are wrong, but that's often what we think the Christian life looks like. And if we stop to think about how we lived our lives, we may say, oh, I don't, I don't agree with that intellectually, but the way that I live, it's as if I'm trying to get to where I need to be. Uh, the passage I actually really want us to focus on today is Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7. Uh, Colossians 2. So, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him. And today what I want to do is spend a bit of time of what does it mean to receive Christ Jesus as Lord, but also what does it mean to live in Him? How does the the way we are saved, how does that change the way that we do live? And to give you, you, just in case you fall asleep, I hope you don't, but just in case you fall asleep, this is where, this is the point I'm trying to make, so it doesn't come as a surprise to you. That is, when we receive Jesus as Lord, we are, oops, ah, trying to get control of this thing, there we are. Uh, when we are saved, we are saved. We become the people of God that He wants us to be. We are presented as holy and blameless, as we'll see in Colossians. What our job is today is to live that out. Of course, there is a gap between what we are and how we live it. That, that's, that's that blue box that is there. There is an, a gap And our job is to go, no, no, I have to live out the truth that Jesus has saved me, that I am one of God's people, I am His child. And so, it's not about being better than everybody else, it's about living out the truth of who you are. Now, if you're a little lost on that, trust me, we will work our way through that, but that is where we are heading. So, let me start with the question of, what does it mean to receive Christ Jesus as Lord? What is what does that mean to be a Christian? Now, if you've come here today and you're going, I actually came here to find out what does it mean to be a Christian, what is the church on about? Great, this is where you need to listen carefully. I'm going to go back, if, you're, uh, if you've got Colossians open, I'm going to go back to chapter 1, verses 21 to 23, it should be up here on the screen. But there are three things that you need to keep in mind when it comes to the Christian gospel. Paul gives us this excellent little summary of it. Once, you were alienated, and you were, uh, you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. Once, you were out of relationship, he's talking to Christians here, once you were out of relationship with God. In, the, in another letter, I was reminded of this this week, that um, uh, in, in the book of Romans, when Paul is outlining what does it mean to live out of relationship with God, the first thing, he says, the first step of Uh, of sin was, we failed to give thanks to God and glorify Him. You see, it's not just about whether we've ticked the boxes, it's not just about if we've lived the right life, actually, that comes out of, are we in connection with God? And Paul's saying, if you're a Christian, once you are out of relationship with God, if you're not a Christian, that's what he is saying, it doesn't matter how good you are, God is not your life coach, He wants to be your father. But now, the second point is, verse 22, but now He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in His sight, without blemish and free from accusation. But now, Jesus has become your Saviour. See, it's not just that He's not just an example, He is an example, but He is, more importantly, your Saviour. He takes at the cross your 
punishment for being out of relationship with God. And so He dies to reconcile us back to God. But there's a third thing there, isn't there? If, if you continue in your faith, there is a response that is needed, it's not automatic. You need to turn back to God, accept His invitation. And that's what it means, if you continue in your faith, if you trust in what God has done for us. And that is what it means to receive Christ Jesus as Lord. If, you have, if you're here today and you've gone, that, that, that's a very quick summary, but if you're here today and you're going, I, I, I don't think I understand that correctly, I don't think I understand exactly all the details there, please come and talk to me at morning tea. I would love to explain this to you. It is the most important thing that you will understand in your life. But if you are a Christian, you will understand, that is what, that's what it means. So, when we come back to chapter 2, verse 6, that's what it means, just as you've received Christ Jesus as Lord. He is the one who died, so you are no longer an enemy with God, you are now reconciled back to Him. But how did you do that? How did you receive Christ Jesus as Lord? It is because someone made it known to you, someone revealed it to you. Some, now, it might have been all sorts of different ways and, and we're going to be talking about mission as a much larger thing, but let me just say, evangelism is a smaller thing of mission, evangelism is actually a message and you need to make sure that people can hear and understand the message of Jesus. And right now, you have just been given, you've just been trained in how to explain the Gospel in three very simple points. Once, but now, if you. Very easy. Paul gave it to you, I've just highlighted it for you. Now, for the Colossians, they had that as well. Now, just to explain, Colossae is a little village, well, it was a little town that was, you know, Ephesus was like Sydney, it was the big city, uh, Colossae was a little bit like Dubbo, Orange, about a day's travel away uh, and it was there with a bunch of other towns, it was Laodicea and Heropolis. Um, Paul didn't go to Colossae but there was another guy called Epaphras and so as Paul writes to the, the, the Colossians, he reminds, he goes, how did you hear about the Gospel? Well, it, well, you learned it, sorry, I'm going to need to go back a bit, you learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on your on our behalf, who also told you about your love in the Spirit. See, you, in Colossae, you heard it from Epaphras. And later on in the letter, he also mentions, I want you to pray that I'll make it known. And so, he says this towards, he says, he says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray it so that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. That makes it clear that as Paul is writing this letter, he's writing it from prison. Now, I just want you to make, just stop there for a second, look at that. What is Paul not praying for? Paul doesn't pray, I'm going to tell you now, if I am in jail, particularly for the work of the, the Gospel, and I send you out a text to everyone that I know to pray for me, I will guarantee one of those prayer points will be, and pray that God will get me out of jail. I don't really want to be here, this is not a pleasant experience, I want to get out of jail. That's, that's, I'm letting you know right now, that's what you're going to be praying for if I'm in jail, right? Paul doesn't pray for that, you notice that? What does he, what does he pray for? He prays that people might know the Gospel, because that's your biggest need, that's everyone else's biggest need. He's going, I don't care whether I'm in prison or not, that, that doesn't matter, what matters is people hear about Jesus, that the message might go forth, that I might proclaim it clearly as I should. How important is that to you? To make the message of Jesus known? Now, I realise, I just, this is a side point, but I realise it's not always easy. I realise that as we proclaim things about Jesus, people aren't going to like it. And here has been my experience, that when 
you are talking to someone about the gospel, the more that they react badly, uh, you know, hostilely back to you, the more I think the Spirit of work is, the Spirit of God is at work in them. They're, they're being hostile because God is, is at work. Bear with that, see it through and you may see them, turn, I'm not saying it's a guarantee, but you may see them turn to Jesus. But Paul actually again in Colossians, he reminds us of this, it's not meant to be easy. In chapter 1 verse 24, he says, I rejoice in what I am suffering for you and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions, which for the sake of His body, which is the church. What is lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions? Well, it's not the payment for sin, He paid for sin at the cross, so what's lacking? That people might know people might hear about Jesus. And so, if you're in a situation where you feel like, this is costing me, and it may not be that, you know, you're filling up your body, you know, that there is not someone kind of uh, causing you physical pain, but they might be causing you emotional pain or psychological pain. If that's where you are at the moment, you're actually in the right spot. We are meant to suffer for the work of the Gospel. I, I think, I need to mention this, because in Australia, when we start suffering, when we start getting persecuted, people in churches tend to panic and go, what are we doing wrong? I'm saying, no, 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 relax, you're actually doing it right. Now, I want to ask you some diagnostic questions about how your church is going and how you are going in terms of reaching the lost. I've got four questions. Uh, the first is, have you lost your sense of lost? I, my, I have a superpower. My superpower is the ability to lose things. People go, yeah, yeah, I lose it. No, no, you don't understand how powerful my, my power is. Like, I was doing a seminar once, I used a, a whiteboard pen, I put the pen down, it took three of us 20 minutes to find the pen again. Right? I didn't even leave the room, it was just like that, that's how powerful it is. But these days, I don't lose things anymore. And that's, that's mainly, I've, I've left my phone there, but it's mainly because of my phone. Actually, I've lost my phone. Um, see, I don't, I don't need to lose my wallet, because everything I need in my wallet is on my phone. And so, I don't lose my keys, because my keys now have this little thing attached to it, little uh, air tag thing, so I can find it from my phone. If I do lose my phone, that's okay, because I've got my watch, my watch is connected to my phone, and I, just, I, I can even go into another city, I don't get lost, because I've got Google Maps. We don't lose things anymore. But because of that, I wonder if we've, uh, we've lost our sense of spiritual lost. That we've lost the sense of, as we look around those who are there, to go, these are men and women who are facing God's wrath without Jesus. These are men and women who are facing hell. And if that is something that has not grabbed your heart, I want to ask you to pray that God will change your heart to have a concern for the lost. Because unless you are concerned for the lost, the rest of the questions I've got aren't really going to matter. See, at the end of the day, the reason why Paul prays that he is in chains, but he prays that he might proclaim the gospel clearly as he should, is because the gospel is the one thing that everybody in Sydney needs to hear. It's the one thing that people need and the church is the only organisation that makes the gospel known. We might do all sorts of things, we might do community things, we might do parenting things, that's a good thing to do, we might do uh, other things, like food. I love food, food's a good thing. You can do that, other organisations will do that as well, but if you want to hear how to be reconciled to God, only the church will do that. And if you're not doing that, what are you doing? It's like a soccer team that doesn't play soccer. So, let me ask you, have you lost your sense of lostness? Uh, let, me, let me ask you some other questions. Um, 
these are more practical questions, but I want you to ask these questions as a church, and I don't want you to say, well, that's the leader, that's the leader's job, but we'll let the leaders work this out. No, no, you are responsible here. And the first question is, in terms of church, if church is the place where people will hear the gospel, do people know that you exist as a church? So, it, would people in the 100 metre radius, for example, of where we are sitting right now, would they know that you are meeting here right now? Or whoever it is that you're looking to, to reach? Or let me put it in a more stark way. If you stopped meeting next week, would anybody care? Would anybody notice? You need to make sure that people actually know that you exist. Hey, we're a light to the lost come and find us. Secondly, do people know you? It's one thing to know that you exist, another thing to know... Now, from what I've seen, the little I've seen, I don't know you very well, but you seem to have a lot of great uh, moments through the week of, come and join us. If you're a parent, come and join us here. Uh, if you want to come early and you can get free coffee, coffee is really good. If you weren't here this morning, you missed out. Make sure you don't miss out next week. But as you're talking, this is the point where you get to know people and connect with them so that they can see what it means to follow Jesus. And finally, of course, do people know Jesus? Do people know how to know Jesus? Like I said, all these other things might be really important, but unless people are hearing about how am I reconciled to Jesus, the whole thing is pointless. Now, how is that happening in this church? I don't know. You need to work that out. How are, we, how are we making sure it's clear that if people come in, that they know about Jesus? Now, we, there are lots of different ways that you can do this. There's books, there are online courses, there are... Um, but what we found... I work for an organisation called Reach Australia. We work with a lot of churches around the country. What we have noticed is that Australians tend not to understand the Bible particularly well. If you're not if you, if you don't believe me on this, go and watch one of those um, game shows, the, the trivia game shows, uh, like, what do we watch? The, the Chase. And whenever there's a Bible question on, see how well people answer it. I, mean, I saw someone, who led the Israelites through the, re, uh, the, the, sea, the Red Sea? And the answers were Abraham. I'm like going, you, don't, you haven't read the Bible, you don't know the Bible. People don't know their Bibles. So, people tend to need, they need more time with people in the Word to understand what God has done. What we have found is running courses over a number of weeks actually works really well. If you want a recommendation, I would recommend uh, Taste and See is a course that's just been written recently. The reason I think it might work here is it, it matches gospel ministry with food uh, and I figure that's always a win. So, um, now, I do want to, let, let me ask you an even harder question and as I ask this, I realise God is sovereign, He is the one who saves people, but the question is, how many people have become Christian at this church over the last two years? Do you know? The Gospel, in chapter 1 verse 6, uh, Paul mentions the Gospel is bearing fruit all over the world. It is bearing fruit in Sydney. The question you need to ask is that, why is it bearing fruit in this church? If not, why? Now, I'm asking you these hard questions because I love Jesus, I love the Gospel and I love you. I, I'm asking hard questions because you need to ask these hard questions to go, are, are we loving Jesus? Are we glorifying Him? Is He saving people here? Why not? Why not you? Why not this church? That's mission. I'm going to move on to maturity mainly because Terence won't let me speak for three hours, so um, let's see how we go. What does it mean, though, once you, become, once you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, to live in Him? What does that mean? What does that look like? Now, it's interesting that, you know, remember we, we did that Gospel presentation, um, as Jesus dies, He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you, holy in His sight. You are already considered holy by Jesus' ministry. So, what is Paul's ministry? What is our ministry? 
He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. That is, that you might live out this great salvation that you have been given, that you might live out the holiness that God sees in you now. Now, I reckon a lot of us, like me, like this is one of my mistakes I've had, is, you know, when we go, we go, I'm going to get, look, I'm a sinner, I'm always going to be a sinner, but when I get to heaven, everything's going to be sorted out. So, if I I I don't need to push myself too hard, because one day, Jesus will come back and I'll be perfect, and so I'll just wait till then. Anybody else with me on that one? Yeah, okay, yep. Well, here's the thing, as Paul writes, he says, since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not uh, on earthly things, for you have died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with Him in glory. He's saying, yes, one day you will appear in glory, but notice what He says, Christ is in heaven and you are with Him in heaven. So, if you're waiting until that moment, then you are in heaven for your Christian life to be together, you're there. It starts today. I want you to keep that in mind next time you are tempted to sin. Next time you're tempted to sin, you know that sin, I know everyone has that, they have a sin. And they're tempted to do that and go, would I do this in heaven? And if the answer is no, then you need to say, I'm not doing this now because I am there now. You do not need to wait until you are there. Now, I have teenage children, Uh, one of the things they love telling me is, I'm just, they'll say something, I'll go, can you say that? He goes, I'm just living my truth. (laughs) Have you ever heard that one? I'm just living my truth. And they say it like that, you you, you can't just say, I'm living my truth, you got to, I'm just living my truth, so you just need to accept me for who I am. And it used to annoy me quite a lot because I'm going, no, 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 that's not how things work. And then I stopped and I realised, actually, they're right. They're just wrong about what they think their truth is, but that's what the Christian life is. I am living my truth that my truth is that I am raised in heaven. I am one of God's people. I am a citizen of heaven. I am a child of God, adopted into His family. I am seen as holy and blameless because of the work of Jesus. That's my truth. I just need to live out my truth. But there is a gap, I realise. Um, uh, my wife and I are reading a book at the moment called The Expectation Gap uh, by a guy called Steve Cuss. He actually opens, oh, I, I thought I'd have the quote there, but he has the, um, he opens, he says, many of us struggle with a gap between what we believe about God and what we experience from God. But that's the whole point of what that blue line, that blue th- shading thing is. I'm learning to live out my truth. I haven't got there yet, but I'm getting there. Now, what does that look like? Well, to understand that, we really need to understand the rest of the book. Again, Terence won't let me stay here for three hours, so let me go through this very quickly. There are three things that we need to understand about loving, uh, about living the Christian life, and they're all about loving. The first is, do we love Jesus? I've got some references there that you'll need to look up later on, but in chapter 1, verses 15 to 20, Paul gives the, the Colossians this beautiful, majestic picture of Jesus. And he goes, that's your Saviour, that's your King, love Him. And do you love Jesus more than your ministry that you do at church? Do you love Jesus more than your work, your career? Do you love Jesus more than your family? Uh, I've been, I changed jobs about 18 months ago, I was working in a church, uh, now work for Reach Australia. People over the last 18 months have been asking me, Uh, are you enjoying your job? And for the last 18 months, I've realised I haven't, there's something wrong, I I didn't know how to answer the question. 
And I, I thought it was me, I didn't know how to answer the question. And then I was having a meeting with someone last week and we were discussing my job and where it needs to go over the next, next 18 months. And I realised it wasn't me that was the problem, it was the question. You see, do I enjoy my job isn't the question. The question is, do I love Jesus? And am I serving Him? That's what makes my job worthwhile. Now, I realise some of you are sitting there going, well, that's easy for you, you're in Christian ministry, of course you should love Jesus and serve Him in your job. But that's true for everybody. See, if you're a doctor, do you love Jesus? What you should be doing is loving and serving Him. How you do that is by loving and serving your patients. But what you're doing is loving them, not just helping them to get better. It will change the way you do that. If you're an accountant, same. In fact, if you're an IT person, you'll be loving and serving your screen. No, you'll be loving and ser- <laughs> you'll be loving and serving those that you're working with. But that's how you love Jesus. Do you love Jesus? Do you love the truth? Uh, we won't go into this in a great amount of detail, but in chapter uh, two, verses sixteen to twenty-three, Paul goes through a number of things, and he says, "Don't, don't." don't get caught on these things, they might be good ideas and some of them are good ideas, he goes, but don't love them more than you love Jesus. It's just, don't don't get caught there. Uh, Actually, in chapter 2, verse 8, he says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. I actually like the way John Calvin translates this, he says, beware lest anyone plunder you. You've been given a great treasure in the Gospel, and he's saying, and, and Paul and John Calvin are saying, don't let anyone come along with another idea to distract you while they take that away from you. Do you love the truth? And thirdly, do you love others? I mean, that's the whole point. In chapter uh, 15 to 17, uh, sorry, chapter 3, verses 15 to 17, it's particularly about how, to, how do you live as you live with each other, bearing with one another, Now, I don't think that's meant to be a hallmark card, I think it's actually difficult to sometimes bear with one another as we seek to live out our truth. So, he writes it not because he's going, oh yeah, you'll be fine. He goes, no, no, actually, sometimes that's hard. But that's what you need to do, that's what it means to love each other. And then actually, uh, in chapter 3, verses 18 uh, to 4, verse 1, he talks about the household. I realise not many of us have uh, masters and slaves in our household, I don't know, maybe yours, but uh, that was what the ancient household looked like, what does your household look like? Mums, dads, kids, perhaps grandparents are there as well. The question is, are you loving people enough? Now, again, I'm going to give you a, a, a quick kind of diagnostic. I borrowed this from somebody else I, I met the other day. And he came up with these, these four symbols. He goes, now, th- this is kind of a journey that we go on. If you're not a Christian, you may be asking the question of, is the Gospel for me? And if that is, come and talk to me at Morning Tea, I'd love to explain it. For many of us, we go, yes, it is for me, I've ticked the box, I'm with Jesus, that's great. But have we moved on to, it's for you, it's for others around us? And then there's a multiplication one, that's supposed to be the X thing, that is, is it for other organisations as well? Is it for other things, other churches in this area, other mission organisations, you know, whatever it is that's there? This Bible college, for example. Where is your heart on that line? Now, if you, you guys have small groups here, don't you? Yeah, okay, here's an experiment I want you to do in the small group, you can take a photo of that, is in your small group this week, what I would like you to do is, I think someone's going to take, take one and we'll pass it around or something, I don't know, yeah, yeah, we'll be right. Take a photo, you'll be right. Um, is, you know when you, you, you do your small group and then everyone shares prayer points? What I want you to do is, when you take the, do you, uh, when the first round of doing uh, prayer points, and I'll be doing this with mine on Monday, is going, how many of our prayer points was just in the tick column? How many were actually in those other columns along the way? Do we actually love, the point is, do we love people enough that we want to see them grow in Jesus? Do we love people enough that we actually want them to see, to come to know Jesus? See, the, the whole point of the Gospel is that, so, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, 
That is a great moment, isn't it? So continue in Him. The Gospel, the Christian life, is an incredible moment of us living out the grace that God has given to us in the Gospel. It's all about the Gospel. We don't move on from it, we live it. We try and make sure we live out the the holiness that is there. And so, I want to leave you with one last, I've given you a bunch of things to do, a bunch of homework to do. This is the most important one. If you are a Christian here today, this is the thing I want you to do this week. I want you to take some time, if you're a coffee drinker, grab a cup of coffee, if you're not, I'm very sorry. But what I want you to do is have a, take, take some time, have a beverage of your choice and evangelise the most important person in your life who needs to hear the Gospel and that's you. See, as you hear the Gospel, you will actually want others to know it. As you hear the Gospel, you want to grow in it. Mission and maturity actually go together. Because as you are actually telling people the Gospel, you're evangelizing two people, the person who needs to hear about Jesus and yourself. I always, when I, I get an opportunity to talk to people about Jesus, I always go, this is fantastic. And I walk away going, Jesus is really good. I need to tell more people. But I don't know about you, I always find when it comes to telling people about Jesus, it's, it's, like, the, uh, it's, it's, it's like going on a roller coaster. You know the worst part of the roller coaster? is that when you're going up the, the, the big steep thing, and that, that's the worst part, right? Because you you, you're anticipating how bad it's going to be, then you get to the top and it goes, and you go, this is so much fun, let's do it again. Don't, don't let the, the, the thing up the top stop you. But the best way to do that is to start by evangelising yourself, so that you might grow in maturity, so that you might have a heart for the lost, so that you might live out the Gospel, and help others do that because you love them enough through the Gospel for them to want to live it out as well. Let me pray. Father, thank You so much for the the joy it is to be Your people. Thank You for the grace that is given to us in the cross. It's extraordinary that You would take people who are Your enemies and adopt them into Your family. That's amazing. Father, we thank You for the privilege it is to be Your people. Father, we pray that You will help us to to love this message, to love what You have done so much that we want to build others up in it, that we will want others to help to know that, that, that truth too, whether they know You or not. Father, thank You that You've given us Your Spirit that He will help us to remember the truth that we are holy and blameless in Your sight. Help us now, between now and the day we meet You face to face, to live out that truth, so that we might bring You glory, for You are an incredibly glorious God. We thank You for this in Jesus' name. Amen.